Oh, right. Uh, Ranking of Kings is really fucking good. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. I It's an anime. Yeah. In case that, yeah. Wasn't, in case that wasn't apparent. It is inarguably the best high fantasy anime I have seen in a really long time. Really? It's both like a high fantasy anime, but also kind of a shonen show, but mm. not to the point where the whole contrivance is characters fighting. Hey, buddy. There's my boy. My dog got a haircut yesterday. Yeah. And we, oh, okay, so uh, there's bunnies in my yard. <laughs> there's, we see lots of rabbits, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. But two days ago, I was out on my back deck with my dog in the morning, just enjoying my coffee, doing my mobile games. And I look up and my dog has, he's like really interested in a specific corner of my yard. And then I see him like, plunge his nose like six inches lower than it should go <laughs> I'm like uh oh <laughs> and then i start hearing really loud squeaks I was like oh no <laughs> so i run over there but he's found a nest of baby bunnies oh no so i'm like oh shit cover it real cover it back up real quick there's two like newborn like they have got to be like maybe three days old very very baby bunnies in a really nice little nest. Baby bunnies are famously good at hiding, so they have avoided his note. Like, they don't have a scent. I learned that. They don't have a really strong scent. So even though he, he went back out to that nest and started digging, like, trying to get to them, and he missed them by, like, a good six inches. But because baby bunnies don't have a scent, don't make a sound, and don't move, he could not, my, my golden retriever could not fucking find them. So we have to keep him away from that nest for like a couple of weeks, waiting for the baby bunnies to grow up and get the hell out of here. Yeah. So it's so also a well-known dog problem. Yeah. Well, apparently eastern cottontails are known to make nests in yards with big dogs because they consider the big dog to be a predator deterrent, not a, not huh. a predator in itself. Yeah. There's Finn in our yard. There's another big dog in the yard behind us. So this is a pretty secure spot if you're trying to raise some babies, except that my dog really wants to hold your babies in his mouth <laughs> and just carry them. So I have to keep him away from them. Yeah, I just my I decide my brain just decided that that was interesting idea for like world building hmm. uh, and like imagine a, a fantasy setting where like people make like a, a settlement or whatever at the bottom of a, a mountain controlled by like some big monster because the other monsters won't go up there oh yeah and you're yeah. like you're like 50 you just... 50 odds that it comes down and wants to try to pet us lethally <laughs> yeah. we'll take yeah, it you gotta judge like okay this monster is slightly less hostile so we will live near this monster because it scares the other monsters off right the hawk's not gonna jump down here and get because there's a and fucking it's... monster here yeah it's not really <laughs> interested in killing us it's just a sort of interested in us which is a problem Mm -hmm. but not in a like it wants to hunt kill and eat us it just like doesn't know that it's a monster and just wants to pet humans and yeah. that's that's deadly <laughs> which sounds like that's what finn just wants to like pick them up and carry them he just wants to have one in his mouth he's yeah. not gonna eat it he just wants to hold it but yeah. he doesn't realize that you can't hold a baby bunny in your mouth yeah you can't do that buddy yeah same idea I feel I feel bad for the people who started listening to this and were like, "Oh man, a ranking of kings review," and then we just ADHD'd away from. The oh, rest I'm of sorry. It. <laughs> yeah, talk about talk about ranking of kings. Part of me was like, <laughs> "We didn't loop back around to this, and maybe I'll just leave it hanging because it's funny." Like, there's gonna be someone in the audience who's like, who's like, "Oh, I really wanted to know about the rest of that, and we just never yeah. finish it." Okay, so <laughs> you talk about ranking of kings. Sure, it's on Crunchyroll, and it's in English. And the English dub is pretty good. Yeah, dubs fucking rule now. Yeah, Kids they these do. days don't know how good they got it's, it. It's true. It's so true. And the the big thing that like sort of sets it apart from every other show of a similar genre or genre blend uh, is that the main character is disabled. Both like really, the, yep, he's deaf and nonverbal. That's the word. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, and also is kind of implied to also be like developmentally disabled, which is sort of a plot point. He's kind of magically developmentally disabled, but it's still kind of a big deal. And just like, I guess, a warning. The first couple episodes are about how, like, people treat him poorly because he's disabled. But then that sets up the framework for and, and the contrast for there are people who don't treat him poorly. And there are people who are like, I understand you're disabled. Let's find a thing that works for you and your disability. 
Oh, that's wonderful. You have to kind of understand the framework that, like, this is a place that is unkind, like, the world is unkind to him. And that makes the people who are so much more valuable. Yeah. And there's, like, there is a, a character who I will not reveal what, who or what they are, who tell him pretty early on, like, I know you want to give up, but remember that you are precious and beloved to many. And that's so important. So don't, oh, geez. don't give up. <laughs> and that's, like, in one of the first four episodes. And it's just, like... It's so fucking compelling, and every character is complicated and interesting. Uh, no black hats. No one is pure evil or, like, cloyingly good. Everyone is fucking complicated and interesting, and it will set up a character to be like, wow, what an asshole. I bet he's going to be pure antagonistic. And then they have a sympathetic turn. Okay. Every single character. I've, I'm not really much of a hardcore anime fan anymore but like i heard from a bunch of different people that this was really good and they were all very different people and when like a whole bunch of very different people are like no this show is good you're like oh i bet it is really good if a whole bunch of people with very different tastes all agree yeah yeah so i went to the trouble of finding it and putting it on and i was like oh shit anime is good again <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Bonus Experience. We're a podcast with a deeper look at the play experience and the finer details of running and writing games. We are queer women speaking with authority about games. And yes, we swear. Mm, die mad about it. Die mad about it. Die mad about it. I'm Monica, your host, podcaster, professional game designer, mechanics maven, mm -hmm, wearer mm -hmm. of pants. You do wear pants. I do wear pants. And long coats. That. Hey, you've got like this whole like cowboy wizard thing going lately that I'm really into. I'm Ray. I'm not a cowboy wizard. <laughs> Someday, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think cowboy wizard is ever an aesthetic that I've like. I appreciate it. Yeah. But it's not like I don't know what I don't know what my. Um, I think the closest I've come to an aesthetic is I'd really love to be like goblin chic. Yeah. Yeah. So I could wear like a snuggie, but have like flawless makeup. But also like dollar store rings, like I big love chunky plastic. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> what else? Am I? Uh, I'm a I am a professional game writer and designer and facilitator. And you know me, you know Monica. It's you know been us. five years of this. Yeah, I mean theoretically, someone could could be tuning in just now. We could have new fans. Ideally, we are consistently raking in new fans. That's sort of the sort of the mm -hmm. goal. True. We do okay. want more people to listen to us. Please tell your friends about it. Make your yeah. friends listen to us. Yeah. Hold them down. Hold them hold them down. <laughs> <laughs> but like in a friendly... Yeah, put it on in the car where they can't like change rivalry. the dial. Yes, there yeah. you go. Yeah, <laughs> like take your friend on a really long drive. Don't tell them where they're going and just put on bonus experience. Yeah, I mean... And BXP... then stare at them while you drive. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't, eh, don't. you like please, it? <laughs> please keep your eyes on the road, but stare with them metaphorically. Uh, today we're going to talk about forever GMs. We sure are. Monica. Yes. What is a forever GM? And are they good or bad? Because I need to have a moral judgment attached to this concept. Okay. Thanks, Twitter. No problem. <laughs> a forever GM is the person in a gaming group who always runs or facilitates the game. Usually this is in the context of D&D, &D, where they're the only person willing to run adventures or campaigns, but let's be real, it's not limited to it. You can have a forever GM who always introduces a gaming group to new things, or the forever GM who's the only person brave enough to run Exalted or Shadowrun or Mage or so on. So I, I think the forever GM actually serves a really valuable purpose. I, I keep hearing it in the context of people who are forced into this position, though, which is never good. You don't want to make someone constantly run your games if they don't want to be doing that. They're going to get burnt out. You're going to lose a GM. And also don't make people do things they don't want to do. Yeah. But... I think that a willing forever GM, an enthusiastic forever GM, is a really valuable role to play in the uh, in the gaming community at large. Yeah, I I agree. I don't really think they're good or bad. It's kind of a neutral state of affairs, other than like the forced position, like you just said. Don't don't make your friends do things they don't want to do. However, that that sort of ties directly into my next point, which is that they can be kind of frustrating for the person assuming this role. 
there are a number of perceived barriers to entry to running slash facilitating games. And we do cover ways to help get over that in some of our earlier episodes, which we'll try to remember to drop into the show notes. Right. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we, we they, they, Like, listen, we will try to provide links, but, you know, maybe you should just listen to our back catalog. Hmm? Just go have a good time. Just, with just go it. have a good time with it. Just go find them, and you know, if you're looking, listen to this episode. There's other ones like underneath it or above it. So, just maybe <laughs> just maybe just click on another one. We got some good GMing advice. Anyway, there's like 24 hours worth of bonus experience. Just go have some time. Yeah, have some fun. <laughs> just go enjoy. Go mm-hmm. enjoy us. Yeah, just have fun with us. <laughs> so, so why do we like forever GMs? And what the fuck is a game ambassador? Because that's going to be in the title of the episode. Well, I honestly like to think of the Forever GM as an entry point to the game because they're either passionate about the game or they possess system mastery, or if we're lucky, they have both, which makes them a great ambassador to the game. My best example of this is our buddy Terry, who has been running Mage for new players for over a year now, I think. like He's basically had this new player introduction program that he's running that he's he's just been introducing people to mage which is fucking awesome he's ambas- he's an ambassador for mage basically my worst example of this is shadowrun and I, I think kind of infamously in a previous episode i talked about how the shadowrun core book was the only game book i've ever had to return to a game store because after opening <laughs> it i realized it would be impossible for me to run it without someone actually demonstrating the game for me And Shadowrun players have later confirmed that for me, that yes, I do need someone to actually run Shadowrun for me and kind of initiate me into it before I can actually figure out how to run it on my own. Yeah. Weren't our our acolytes of the good doctor trying to get us to play Nobilis and Glitch and Wisher Theurge Fatalist? Uh, And then they were like, (laughs) oh, but don't actually read the book. Let us show you how to do it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, we've had a couple of friends like, don't read Glitch. We will play Glitch. And then you can read Glitch. (laughs) (laughs) Which I'm down for. Yeah, yeah, I'm down for it. Jenna doesn't make games. She makes gay experiences. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to experience these things the way they were intended to be experienced. And that is through uh, a disciple of the good doctor telling me about them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And par- uh, now I'm like, did Jenna do that on purpose? It's possible. It's I don't possible. Know. I, I, I'm, even if she's listening to this episode going, no, I didn't. I'm going to give you credit for it anyway. I res- uh, Jenna, if you're listening, have dinner with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jenna, if you're Jenna, listening, I really, please. Jenna, I really respect you. Have yeah, dinner please, with me. <laughs> please email us, Jenna, if you're listening. Um, and we would like to talk to you a lot. Thank you, yeah. Jenna. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, please. Jenna. Please, please, uh, are you proud of me? <laughs> Dr. Moran, please. Dr. Moran, please. Uh, all right, but also, like, hey, if I don't run Exalted, nobody will play it with me. Uh, <laughs> which, you know what, that's not, that's not right? true. That's not, that's not 100% true. Uh, H will run it, and I, I, I've got you. I have a lot of friends who are really into Exalted, but, like, outside of that group of people, uh, if I don't run Exalted, nobody will play it with me. Uh, and H and I have a symbi- symbiotic relationship is mutual forever, GMs. You're like binary stars orbiting yeah, each other. we're orbiting each other. <laughs> if if she's not the forever GM, it's me. Mm-hmm. And we, we have pretty different taste in games that we want to run, actually. So that kind of makes it pretty nice for our group because I will run very different games than she will. Uh, mm-hmm. And so our group kind of gets a nice exposure to a whole bunch of things. And it also means that I get to play in things that I wouldn't normally run and vice versa. Yeah. 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 But we're also very lucky to have an extremely easygoing group who really aren't all that interested in the work of facilitating games. And this is fine, honestly. Facilitation is a lot of work. Mm-hmm. and I. But the cool thing is that they will try anything that we put in front of them. They've never said no to anything. We've been like, <laughs> I'm not that into, into it. Like, sometimes we realize in the middle of play that it is just not... We just weren't that into it, but that's okay. Like, no one's ever been like, let's not play this game based on its title. Yeah. They'll, they'll try anything, and that's awesome. Get you a game group who will just try anything. <laughs> uh, and so we keep buying games for ourselves, but also to show them, because we know they're going to be like, yeah, sure, we'll try that. That's awesome. Yeah, and it puts us. this puts us into a good place to talk about being a game ambassador. 
when you are the person who always runs the game, and especially for a group like mine, you're not just being the person who makes the good time happen, you're the person introducing them to other things out there. Like you just described, someone like Terry, who has so much passion for a game like Mage, can make other people become fans too. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. good, old, good old reverse gatekeeping at its finest. Drag all your friends into everything you like. And that's also like, just a basic, like like a teaching kind of in it that's like the what am i trying to say that's like the uh, the the experience of having a really great teacher mm-hmm. a really great teacher just you know like in a school setting is someone who's really passionate about what they're teaching you and that passion is so easy to transmit it's so easy to have that come through into your students who will also get passionate about this thing that you are just so excited to teach them and it's kind of like my single favorite xkcd comic is the one about how you shouldn't make fun of people for admitting they don't know things. And it ran through like this huge equation on how many people there are in the U.S. who are just now learning about something for the first time. And it comes out to like, there's 10,000 people a day who learn a new thing or, or, or something like that. So it's like, don't be like, oh, what you don't know? Oh, my God. You'd be like, oh, my God, you're one of the lucky 10,000. I get to tell you about this. This is great. <laughs> Yeah. Which is, I kind of, I kind of, I like to bring that energy to when people are like, oh, I've never played such and such, or I've never heard of this game. I'd be like, oh, really? And I get to tell them about it. Like, oh, you're in for a that's treat. Exciting. Oh, you're going to love it. Yeah, yeah. That's, oh, that's, you're going to love it. That's, oh, this is, yeah. That's the right yeah. energy to have. It really is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. On that note, I think it's time for a mid-episode break. BXP and the mid-episode break room are brought to you by the Misdirected Mark Network. Bing! Become a BXP patron. Patrons get to chat with us directly. Hey, they get special Discord roles and exclusive hangouts. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month. Yep. I keep forgetting to throw this in here, but if you give us 50 bucks, we will do a very brief ad read, like for your game or your Kickstarter or whatever. So if you are not sure how to get your stuff out there, give us $50. If you give us $20, you become a certified Margaret. And Ray makes you a terrible certificate. They're it's amazing. so bad. They're so bad. Oh, really they are awful. bad on purpose. Print them out. Put them in your office. If you're working in an office with other people, it will make your coworkers question you. And if you are working from home, it will make you happy every time you look at it. Yes. yes. And they're all bespoke. I make them all individually. Yes. I find a whole new cert- certificate word <laughs> template to butcher. <laughs> they're all <laughs> unique and terrible in their own special way. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't like Patreon, you can also support us on Kofi, ko-fi.com slash bonus exp, which has the same monthly subscriptions with the same rewards. Yep. We wanted to make sure, because I also know that Patreon, the, the Kofi is sometimes a little easier for uh, overseas folks. Yep. Or like non-US folks. So if you prefer Kofi uh, and you want to support us there, the rewards are all the same. If you give us money there, the Kofi bot will give you the role. You get all the same benefits of being a patron. It's just from on another website. Yeah. Uh, and you can... uh, we, we're still discussing. There, there's a very good chance that we'll be actually like moving from Patreon to Kofi, if only because Kofi is better for international patrons and Kofi isn't buying into this fucking, fucking crypto, nonsense. crypto bullshit that, that, yeah, don't even get me fucking started. Kofi is vastly superior but we still need to like you know make, take our time with this and not just drop one and go straight to the other yeah we are thinking about slowly moving over so if you want to migrate your stuff over there go for it also we have a merch page bxpcast.com slash bxp swag we are sponsored by nerdy kepi you can get all kinds of rad queer swag and exclusive bxp swag there's stuff on that site that are not anywhere else if you use code BXPCAST at checkout, you will get 10% off and it never expires. And they did raise their prices a little bit, so that gives you a good reason to go and use the code. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And they've got, they got shorts now. They got shorts now? They got shorts now. Yeah, they have, like, like cool gym shorts, and I bought myself <gasps> several pairs. Athletic shorts? Really? Yeah, they got, they got athletic shorts. They got button-downs. They got joggers. They got skirts. They got dresses with pockets. They got all pockets. kinds of things that gay people like. Bowling shirts. Pins and stickers and bowling Pins. shirts and mugs. And I have a tank top from there that says, Kindly consider dying mad about it, which is not actually BXP <laughs> swag. It's just one of their shirts. It's adjacent. Yeah. yeah go, go support a, a queer owned business. It's uh, like we actually have a bunch of people 
like a bunch of friends that are like on the payroll there. This yep. is not some like big like red bubble conglomerate. No, this no, is literally no. like we have some buddies who own a business and they make really cool merch. So support them. Yes. Check it out. Please support them. Yeah, and you can use that code over and over again. BXP cast. BXP cast. Ten percent off. Yes. Never expires. Also, if you are broke and are like, man, Monica and Ray, I love you guys, but I have no money. We are like, ooh, girl, we feel you. <laughs> <laughs> Saying nice things is always free. You can leave us a good review on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Google, wherever, and help us get more listeners. I don't know where you found us, but wherever you found us, find a way to give us a good review or just, you know, just tell your friends. Tell your whole gaming group. Tell a Discord server you're on. Tell us how, tell them how great we are. That costs zero dollars, and we truly, truly appreciate it. Yep, we sure do. So if you like bonus experience, you'll also like They're a Super Geek. <laughs> They're a Super Geek is an actual play one shot live stream created by three BIMPOC players to highlight the voices of marginalized folks in the TTRPG scene. They feature gender marginalized GMs and a diverse rotating cast of players. Tune in every other Thursday from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern on the Misdirected Mark Twitch. All right, so, Ray. Yeah? Why are people afraid to try running new games? Well, <laughs> I think I think one reason why is uh, just lack of system mastery, which is, I mean, that's a big reason why people are afraid to run any game, period. Facilitating a game requires a lot of a person, and it can be very intimidating. And a lot of people feel like, if I am not an expert at this game, I have no business running it. Which isn't isn't exactly true. And I know that we have another episode where we talk about how to run a game. I think that's like season one. We have a couple of those. We'll put that in the notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have several of them. And specifically with advice on how to run a game, even if you aren't necessarily a master at it. Which Mm -hmm. is basically, basically it comes down to just fake it. (laughs) <laughs> speak with authority and confidence yeah. and if someone is like well i don't think that rule is right you know oh okay and if it's a really quick fix fix it and if it's not go okay well we'll run it like this for now and then after the end of the game we'll talk about you know changes going forward mm-hmm. easy as far as running new games like new new games i mean You've already got a favorite, you've already got the books and the dice and the minis, you've already got a handle on the rules and making content for your players. So with a new, new game, it can be intimidating to start over on a whole new system and a whole new setting. And I mean, I fucking get that. Like, for a long time, all I played was Exalted. So when people were like, oh, but let's play d and I was like, but I already have all the Exalted books. <laughs> and it was honestly kind of a down, down downward down a little down bit of a, little bit downgrade uh, d- it was a down 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 whatever and also there's just straight up clannishness there's sure. been some 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 warranted and some unwarranted pushback lately over the like please play a new game like movement <laughs> <laughs> so some of it is is just clannishness and stubbornness just a fuck you i will continue playing dnd harder I'm just like all right cool all right. buddy <laughs> You're totally right. Uh, and like, <laughs> like we keep repeating, we have an episode on getting over the hump of feeling like you must have system mastery because you don't. You, you really do don't. Not. You don't. It's not required. You just Listen, need, I don't you... even have system mastery of the games that I write for. <laughs> system yeah. mastery is a myth. It is. You just need to be willing to reference the book or to make calls off the cuff, which involves acting yep. with confidence and, yep. you know, boldness, I guess. Boldly go forward. Yep. Do it. Yeah, I believe in you. And sometimes, I'm going to be honest, your calls will be bad. I've made bad calls. That's okay. You can just say, sorry, that was a bad call. Let's figure out a better option if that comes up again to your player. And I get that apologizing and owning up to your mistakes can be very hard, and it's kind of vulnerable, but like, let's be real, it's about a game. Yeah, And that's a great a time to practice grace with real low stakes. Yeah, honestly. It's a good way to, you know, it's a good way to get in your experience at apologizing for your mistakes, because the worst that can happen, it's a, it's a fucking it's game. A fucking you got a game, game rule wrong. It's not yeah, a big deal. <laughs> there's really not a big deal. Maybe you've hurt someone's feelings, and that can really feel weird, but like, it was over a game rule. It's not like yeah, you hurt someone's feelings yeah. in a serious don't relationship. You, it's just, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Practice grace, don't worry about low stakes. It. Yeah. Also, let's talk about play something else for a sec. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was very recently struck by the sort of realization that people sometimes say, just run stuff in D&D, but what they mean is use a D20 and modifiers and maybe hit points or healing surges and some spells and or classes to prop up the improvisational roleplay of the story we want to tell. 
And they don't actually mean <laughs> cram that square peg of every single game, every single rule in the game entirely into this round hole. And straight up, if you're doing the former, that is fine. And yeah. while that likely yeah. annoys me to call it D&D, that's not because I'm like a D&D &D purist <laughs> who thinks you have to use every rule. It's actually because I'm like, no, you made up a thing. You took these other rules, massaged them into something else. Give yourself credit for that. You did a game design. Yes, you made a game. You're not playing D&D &D anymore. But that's not something I'm saying with derision. That's something I'm saying with awe. Like, you're yes. not playing D&D &D anymore. You're making your own game. Yeah. Take credit for that. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Though I will say that branching out and playing other things will create that sort of improvised game you're making at home so much easier. And I encourage you to learn new things, not so that you can just quit playing D&D &D and never play D&D, &D, your favorite game, ever again. I would never ask you to stop playing your favorite game, but so that you can make off-the-cuff decisions at home when you are making up your own shit so much better. Mm -hmm. Like, the mm -hmm. thing about playing other games is that it teaches you different stuff that are not present in D&D, &D, and I think that's why some people get head up about it. Yeah. Because the tools that are in the toolbox of D&D &D 5th Edition do not cover everything, and there's a lot of stuff out there that can definitely just make your game better by learning about what they are. Uh, and very recently, I introduced a friend to the PBTA social question askers literally earlier this week, specifically for use in a D&D like frame, because she was the person talking about how like they played all these games in D&D. &D, and then I, when I asked a couple more questions, it was like, oh, we just kind of just rolled some D20s. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah. So you made up you made up improv tools. You yeah, made that. Yeah. You made that. Uh, <laughs> and like I was like, okay, so you could have this like charisma role. And based on <laughs> I showed her the Omni system success chart which is basically yeah. like the pbta partial success chart but specifically for a d20 plus modifier yeah, and i yeah. was like yeah if you understand that like partial success makes things significantly more interesting here's these specific questions you can ask behind the success that they rolled on this chart and you can control the way players ask for information about solving a mystery based on their charisma role and she was like, holy shit, that's so much easier. I don't have to, like, <laughs> when someone makes a, a nat 20 on a charisma check, I don't have to make the hard decision to be coy or to give away the whole plot because I have the structure yeah. that tells me what information I can give away. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, like think about how, you know, like, some people get really, really, really into randomized tables. Mm -hmm. I, I like to write randomized tables. I love to design randomized tables. I hate gaming with randomized tables because <laughs> the ideal randomized table has a lot of really cool shit on it and you're only going to see like one or two things so think of your if you if you're going to use this question asker idea for modifying your say your D, &D game mm -hmm. think of it as creating a randomized table but then instead of okay we'll roll to see which of these questions you get to ask Instead, it's roll to see how many of these questions you yeah. can ask. So it's not just, okay, we'll pick one cool thing at random. It's you get to decide which of these cool things you want to ask or yeah. interface with or whatever. And the questions I proposed were, what is the character really feeling? What do they wish I'd do? How can I get them to blank? What aren't they telling me? Who do they hold negative emotions towards? Who do they hold positive emotions towards? And the, the, the suggested system I made lets you ask up to three of them, and there are six questions. Yeah, So there will great. always, always yeah. be something on that list that you can't get the answer to. Yeah. Uh, and then good. I threw That's out a stuff. little advice that when you say, like, what aren't they telling me? You don't have to give away the plot secrets, but you can give away hints that, like... Because mm -hmm. she's thinking yeah. about writing, like, a Weird West game. And so my suggestion was like, oh, if someone asks, what aren't they telling me? You could be like, because the, if they're investigating like the, the town marshal, he might be hiding his secret affair with the undertaker mm -hmm. because he's afraid mm -hmm. of blackmail rather than be a f reveal that he's participating in the rampant corruption that the characters are pursuing. Right. Right. You don't yes. have to give away yes. that lead, but you can give away that he's afraid of being blackmailed because that is also still important. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> question askers are so good yeah and, and like I <laughs> every game should have question askers th they should but uh, i also feel like giving that particular advice of like hey when someone asks what aren't they you know what aren't they telling me that you don't have to give away the farm yeah the answer has to be correct and honest but it doesn't have to give everything away but also you don't you don't want to stonewall people i mean also this really wasn't a realization i kind of always knew this that people do this i've done it yeah Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just kind of eye-opening to consider it a little bit more formally. And also mm -hmm. because I kind of just wrote a little system guide 
for my friend, I was like, maybe I can just write these little system guides and sell them. Do you think people would buy that? Yeah. Yeah. Just like a basic, like, so you're playing D&D, but not really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's some little widgets to add. Yeah. Here's a you're whole not bunch exactly of widgets D&D. to, like, put into your game. Here's a little way to modify the dice rolls. Here's a whole bunch of things to think about. Like, this isn't, I'm, I'm not telling you what the game is or the setting is. I'm just giving you the tools so that you can make that up. Yeah, like little system agnostic. Yeah, and like I also suggested that she look at Fate Accelerated because what they were doing with D&D was basically just Fate Accelerated. Oh, yes, Fate Accelerated. Okay, well, on that note, like I think we need to start talking about good places to begin with games that are kind of easy to run, easy to learn, and easy to play. Oh, boy. Easy is so subjective. Like we literally just talked about Fate and PBTA, but there are a lot of people who bounce off of those games. Or don't even really yeah. like them. That's just not for them. Or they just kind of don't grasp the things that they do, right? And this is okay. Not all games have to be for people. There's plenty of games out not, there that aren't for me. Not every game is for every person. Yeah. Plenty of games out there that aren't for me. And I could say that, like, you know, maybe you want to start with games more focused specifically on storytelling. Like Wander Home. Or any of the other games we read last season, like Gunslinger as mm-hmm, another good mm-hmm. sort of very storytelling focused game. But that might not be easy for you if you don't have a background already in improvisation and mutual storytelling. Like, if you're a person who's who came up on, like, role-playing online on forums or chat rooms, this might actually be a good gateway for you. Yeah. Because you yeah. already have that background. Or if you're in, you've taken improv classes or, or are an improv comic, that sort of thing might actually be much easier for you than something more structured, right? But if you're mm-hmm. not, this might be too much freedom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> as As we've seen... With the tweet <laughs> that passed through our collective consciousness, this guy who was like, I hate fate. And he oh, read like God. Yeah. 800 pages of fate and he hates that it isn't a physics simulator. He thinks that narrative games are for people who don't get math. He thinks it's uselessly sentimental to want your character to not die. And also there's no falling damage. All right, piss off, Carl. (laughs) And the person who who shared the tweet, on, who shared this on Twitter was like, okay, please don't track this commenter down and bully them. This, I was just sharing this because this is a perspective that's so antithetical to my own. This is, oh, this is Klaus von H on Twitter who shared this. But then, you know, of course we all had a fucking go at it, like... Oh, okay, right. If a game doesn't have falling damage, obviously it's inferior. And then we found someone who made a whole game that was the Called only system falling, falling damage. damage. It's really funny. <laughs> right. Some people bounce off of fate because sure. they're not looking for something that's got a lot of narrative oomph. They're looking for something that is just a physics simulator. Yeah. And like, if fate is not for you, don't be like that about it. Yeah. Don't yeah. be fucking, don't be like, well, this is people don't know math. No, fuck you, Carl. Like, we like, <laughs> Carl is not a good, fuck you, Chadwick, Steve, <laughs> Josh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Christopher. Yeah. <sighs> God. Matthew. What other white guy names do we know? <laughs> James. Uh, <laughs> But in like Dandy 5th edition has a ton of rules and a lot of inflexible parts, but you can throw a rock and hit a game of it. So the accessibility of uh-huh. that might be easy to you. Also, it's easy to come by, it's easy to purchase, and it's easy to find support for. Yeah, they've tried, like, I mean, Wizards got that money, so they've done everything they can to make sure that D&D is constantly there. Like, it's it may yeah. not be, like, accessible the way we think about accessible, but the actual materials, like, the ability to spend money on D&D, very easy. Right, so, like, <laughs> there are spell cards if you don't like referencing a book. There are all kinds of tools that change the way you play it. It's very easy to find a game. There are tons and tons of YouTube videos, TikTok videos, tutorials that show you how to make characters and teach you how to play the game, right? So, like... If we're talking simply about ease of use, simply because of its ubiquitousness, it's easy to use. There's so many things out there. Mm -hmm. Even if, like, us system aficionados are like, well, it's not the best system-wise. There's a lot of support for D&D 5e. Right, which makes it easy to get into because of the amount of support. Even if, you know, you and I are like, well, it's not the best rules-wise. But some people really just don't give a shit. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And then, like, things like Exalted Essence, which was literally written with ease of use in mind. It's still fucking Exalted (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and that manuscript is still yeah. 400 pages long yeah exalted i mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. As much, I love, I still love Exalted. I still, Exalted is still my favorite. And I love to work and play in Exalted. Mm -hmm. But it is very Exalted. Yeah. It's so, it's super Exalted. <laughs> I, I honestly, I think when people ask about, okay, well, then what's a game that's easy? I think when some people ask this, they're really asking for, like, what are some gateway games? Like, okay, well, if I've got D&D, &D, then what, what else should I be playing? Like, okay, you want a transitional game. You want a game that would take you from D&D &D into something else that's similar to D&D, &D, but different enough to give you a new experience. And a lot of times, like, I'll point you to a Powered by the Apocalypse game like Dungeon World, honestly, which is fraught because one of the creators was a fucking sex pest. But I mean, damn, it is definitely a D&D &D PBTA game. Mm -hmm. And honestly, a well-designed PBTA is about an archetypal narrative. And when I am asked like, okay, well, what about a similar game? I'm thinking about games that tell similar stories. If you're looking for a similar system, that's like a whole other kettle of fish but the good news is you can't throw a rock without hitting a d20 game now either it's not just for D and d5e like oh everybody's got their own variants on that now we're, do, we're doing the d20 ogl again we could do a whole episode yep. on everything old is new again <laughs> yep <laughs> i i guess what we're saying is that there's just not a very good answer to this question i think the desire to teach or play a game with your friends really overrides everything else mm-hmm uh, the question is, what are you willing to learn? What aligns with your taste? What tones and themes do your group enjoy? Mm -hmm, and like, mm -hmm. genre and style are going to go a really long way, right? Like, if your game yeah, is, if your group's definitely. just not that into fantasy, there's no amount of Exalted being cool that's going to make them like it because it's a fantasy game. Yep. <laughs> you can't really take the fantasy out it, of it. It definitely puts a whole bunch of genres in a blender and then hits it on high speed. And we're going to do an episode about that, actually. <laughs> About exalted yes. genre, we, it's gotta be a it's not a BXP season if we don't do an exalted episode. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna talk about exalted in genre later, but like it's still at its core, sort of mostly fantasy, uh, and there's no separating it from that unless you like completely yeah. reinvent the system yeah. or the setting rather, which you can do. That's cool. Yeah. It's awesome to do an exalted AU. Y yes, yeah. I I have actually been spending a lot of like mental energy trying to think of a a modern. Not not the modern shard that exists already, although you know it's okay. But yeah, I mean it's really it's really hard to take the fantasy out of out of Exalted, as compared to like D and D, where it's like okay, you want a modern D and D, okay, you fucking play Shadowrun. Oh, I mean, you find someone to run Shadowrun for you. <laughs> oh, they're reprinting, they're redoing, they're they're doing a fifth edition D twenty modern, which honestly I'm kind of excited really? about. I love D twenty modern. Oh. Okay. Like, listen, D20, that, right. this is also nostalgia glasses, because D20 Modern was still very much kind of, like, cleaned up 3.5 back in the D20 OGL days, but, like, we played a really fun uh -huh. game of it, and I, like, mostly just remember that. And so I was like, ooh, D20 Modern. Ooh, D20 Modern again. <laughs> ooh, I'd like to see what they <laughs> do, do with it this time. And it's done by the same fantasy. people. I do, I do love an urban fantasy. I do love an urban thing. fantasy. I am, I am a bit of a slut for urban <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> Not supernatural, okay? Yeah, no. Like, I'm okay with supernatural. I'm really more about the urban fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Definite, def like, definitely, like, I went, oh, of all the things, of, of all the D20 <laughs> things that were coming out now uh, in this, in this, oh, in this, in this, D, this OGL2, they were like, hey, the people who made <laughs> D20 Modern in the first place are doing it again 20 years later. And I was like, oh, perha perhaps oh, I will purchase oh. it. <laughs> mm, mayhaps I will twist. <laughs> And take and peep. <laughs> so I mean, oh, okay. Pugmire. So Speaking I already worked this that are out, like D and, and I don't D, &D games oh, yeah, that do something <gasps> very different. How did I forget about Pugmire? I looked over at my shelf, and Pugmire was right there, and I was like, "Oh, Pugmire!" How the fuck did I forget about Pug Pugmire? All right, okay. Pugmire is a great transition. It game. is. It, I mean, it still takes the best of the D the D twenty five E that we have now and puts it into a different setting. And honestly, it's a very compelling. It's interesting. I mean, it's, you could say it's cute, but there's, you cute. know, there's different, there's kind of a sliding scale because there's some stuff that's like, ooh, dire. Oh, wow. There's stakes to this. But it's, you know, you're playing dogs. You're playing dogs and cats and you're fantasy dogs. And it's really yeah, cute. It's really cute. <laughs> and yeah. I really, I've, I've run it. I've run it for our buddy Ryan and I had a blast running it and it was just great. I mean, it, channel your inner furry and play Pugmire. <laughs> 
But I also had like this whole flow chart where I came up with, and now I'm not sure. Like I want, I kind of want to see what Monica thinks of this about like, if you were trying to like boil the frog as it were, and okay. like try to yeah, transition yeah. your players from D and D five E to exalted essence with like the least amount of like trouble, the okay. least amount of complaining, I would probably say go from D and D five E to D and D four E. Okay. To blades in the dark. Okay. And then to essence. Mm. What do you think of that? I think that's too many steps. You think that's too many steps? I think you can actually just go straight from 5e to essence without a problem. Really? You think so? Yes. Yeah. Even though the setting so. and the system is so different. I think you should definitely play 4th edition and Blades in the Dark because they are both excellently designed games. Um, yeah. And and I would like you to read and study those for two very different reasons. Like if we're in Professor Dice Wizard Monica's classroom right now. These are homework, but they are homework for two very different reasons. Uh, <laughs> but like, okay, so let's, because actually Essence was designed specifically in mind to be the next step after 5th edition. But I mean for it to be like, not as a, okay, guys, we're going to try this new game and it's so different and you're going to love it. I mean, in the sense of like trying to kind of trick someone into like, hey, wait a minute, we're not playing d d no. anymore. <laughs> I think you can go right from one to the other. Okay, that's me, a bold choice. Yeah, let me kind of break down a little bit why. Okay. Uh, so first off, if you've played a lot of D&D 5th edition, you already understand how class features and racial features work. Yeah. Pretty yeah. straightforward, right? And that translates pretty directly into exalted advantages and anima effects. Okay, sure. All right. right, I'm with you. It's pretty straightforward. That kind of thing, very direct. Also, if you're playing a solar, unless your D&D character is really tied up in being non-human, mm -hmm. or like some of the weirder parts of D&D spellcasting... You can pretty much make any D and D character directly into a solar. Really, unless it's unless it's a druid, in which case they're a lunar. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> all right. See, that's yeah. why. All right. I'm glad you said unless it's a druid. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so like pretty much any druid concept is either a full moon or a or a no moon, more or less. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh. Yeah. Unless you're like also playing a druid who's big on the charisma thing, in which case I got a changing moon there. Uh, <laughs> but like if you're big on shape-shifting and being like a bog witch that's a hundred percent a no moon yeah full stop i mean absolutely and you can even take whatever your druid spirit shape was from D D and carry it over to exalted without a problem but you i'm but more like, interested in, in how you said that like literally every D, D class could just be a solar yeah like uh you got a you got a cleric mm -hmm. depends on what kind of cleric you're looking at a whole bunch of possible solar options but you do have to understand that like exalted doesn't treat healer as a role mm -hmm. like it's that's not important to it like you you heal by either doing downtime recovery or you have like long-term over effects or you are like a wise sage who knows medicine it doesn't treat healer as a role so that's like that's a slight adjustment but but i don't think that's hard for people to understand no and also also essence by default does not care about characters dying like, it, that's not important to it. When I say it doesn't care, I mean, like, the goal is to keep people playing, not to present death as a threat. Because you're, Yes, right. Death is because not... Because you demigod superheroes. Out of the box, death is not one of the stakes. Right. It's, it's There's not way worse the things stakes. that can happen. <laughs> so when you realize that, like, okay, this is, this is a, a game where we're all sort of super powerful characters, we are all working together, and death is not one of the stakes, you don't have to worry about healing, right? Because when you're playing D&D... &D, Death is one of the stakes that prevents you from continuing the campaign. Mm -hmm. from continuing, And so you need healer as a role to play in that space, right? Right, uh, right? And this is just a difference of how the game treats that approach. And once you understand that, that's not hard to grasp. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's not, it's not a tough concept. I actually am running for a bunch of folks from the internet, and two of them are brand new, and two of them are experienced. And so that's going to be really interesting. And... I walked through one of my friends through making her human barbarian into a Dawn cast. Yes, Real perfect. fucking easy. Great. Real no fucking notes. easy. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Well, you can make a Dawn cast, a paladin, a barbarian, a fighter, a ranger, a ranger even. Mm -hmm. a like, monk. ranger sort of dips a little bit into night cast, depending on what you're doing. Or Zenith, uh, even. Or Zenith. Yeah, Zenith also does paladin pretty well. Like, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy unless you're really invested in, like, the spell casting part to kind of carry it over mm -hmm. and even like i'm a wizard you know i want to memorize spells i want to do big spell casting things well then you have sorcery yeah which is which is yeah. just just wizardly spell casting on fucking steroids <laughs> like yeah <laughs> or necromancy like if you're 
if you want to be a necromancer, like you have that option there. And if you want to go with the whole like warlock, someone else gave me this power. I make a blade out of magic. You know, I summon dark things. But you've got infernal and abyssal right there. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) It's covered. (laughs) Yeah. And if you're really a, a big fan of like playing Warforged, Alchemical is right you there. You got Alchemical right there. You got yeah. Alchemical, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know that there's an undead D&D class, but like if you always wish there was, uh, or race rather, but if you always wish there was, Liminal is right there. I keep seeing rules for Revenant style yeah, characters, sure. but I'm not oh, sure yeah, if that yeah, was yeah, Fourth Edition had not. a Revenant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they were undead. Okay. You so play if a Revenant. Like, yeah, if you like Revenant, <laughs> Liminal is right there. Yep. Yep. And if you were like, none of the above, I want to make up my own guy, Exigent is right there. <laughs> Exigent is right there. It's really easy to make up your own guy. Yeah. Uh, I guess Monk would be like, all right, well, here's our party sidereal. Yeah. Like, if you're really into the martial arts part of the Monk thing, that makes that makes sidereal really easily. But anybody can be, literally any exalt can be a good unarmed combatant. Yep. Yep. Uh, so it's, you're going, the whoever's running the game for the new D&D person is going to have to be like, okay, well, what are your expectations? Like, what sort of things do you want to do? And then the rest is, like, I know there's a lot of, like, new people don't understand how to roll dice. And it's like, no, they don't, actually. Stop treating new people like they're stupid. I've never had anyone have trouble with learning how the dice pool curve works, right? Yeah. Rolling a fistful of dice, looking for 7, 8, 9, 10, and then counting them is actually super easy. Yes, right. It's just nothing hard about that. Like, my eight-year-old niece could do that. <laughs> I actually have had more people, like, confused by the pool system itself. Like, okay, wait, how many how many am I rolling? And I have to say, okay, right. well, you take this number here and that number there, and you add those, and that's how many dice you're rolling. Yep. Yeah. The pool the end. P- figuring out what two <laughs> things you add together is the harder part. And then remembering, yes. like, oh, my modifiers add more dice or add successes that are invisible, and then I tally them up after I'm done counting, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That 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 part's the harder part than people figuring out the base mechanic. And that's yeah, okay. just that's just a matter of a customization, right? Like even if you were teaching someone to play D&D for the first time too, you still have to add two things and modifiers to a roll, right? Like that steps the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> okay, okay, uh, okay. So like it's and and they're both fantasy. And you can you can ease people into how exalted is fantasy but bigger, weirder, scarier and, you know, more bisexual uh <laughs> by st- and there's a whole lot of places where you can start with things that feel familiar to D people yeah i mean okay uh, if you're like i want to play a tiefling though it's like all right cool you're demon blooded right i want to i want to play an aarakocra though all right cool you're an eagle folk like there's yeah, so there's, many yep, yeah tabaxi. i want to play an yeah, elf the- okay you're fey blooded <laughs> sure or you can just be a human who looks weird you could just be a weird looking human but that's yeah, not as exciting if, as I am an thing, elf, I am a demon person, and I'm sexy and bisexual. If the thing you were, if the thing you were into <laughs> with tieflings is just like I want to be a hot person whose skin is a weird color and I have sexy, sexy horns and a tail, you can just do that. You're just like Exalted is full of people who just look weird. Yeah, <laughs> and like, that's absolutely accurate. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and if it, so, you can you can totally choose if you're like I really want to play a tiefling, I really want to have like a demonic heritage, but you don't know anything about Malpheus because. Exalted Demon is a whole whole other kettle of fish, right? <laughs> you can start being like, well, I look weird and I think I have demonic heritage. And then in game, you can learn about who you are. And isn't yeah. that fucking cool? And then yeah. like you get to learn about Malpheus, this really fucking cool aspect yeah. of the setting. And then and you're then, like, oh like, shit, that's my dad. <laughs> yeah, and then like the more you get into it, the more your GM slides you a copy of Games Divinity and is like, pick a guy who's your dad. <laughs> here's your here's your dad catalog. <laughs> right? Or mom. <laughs> or mom. <laughs> yeah, and then like maybe that player is like, fuck, I want my dad to be Octavian or like yeah, then my they mom see to be a, Mara. Then they see or, a um what's the wasps again the agate 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 yeah then they see an agate and they're like that's my dad (laughs) (laughs) i want to be a wasp demon (laughs) all right cool it would be really cool if someone was like oh i a demon isn't actually my parent like my parents are someone else but a neoma shaped me to look like this that's that's real good too yeah Uh, like but that's so good you just (laughs) you just have to kind of on-ramp people and it's not hard actually it's a matter of asking people what, what they're looking for and what their expectations are and the things they think are cool and then not making them eat the whole elephant at once. Mm-hmm, you just, mm-hmm. you give them little now, bits, right? The, the one the one thing I would caution, though, is in playing 
exalted with people who their primary RPG before that was D&D, I did have to kind of uh, steer them away from like heavily Western ideas of fantasy. Like someone wanted to play like the classical knight who had like a lord and shit and, and was like, you, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, well, there's not as much of that in Exalted. I think the only like classic Western feudalist fantasy that we really have was in the original Abyssals. Is, is that correct? Uh, Sort of. Sort oh, okay. of. Like, I, I like <laughs> it depends on what you're calling traditional Western fantasy. And I think we maybe should put a pit in this for our Exalted Ooh, genre episode. Yes. Hey, Monica. Yeah. Where can they find our show? They can find us at bxpcast.com, part of the Misdirected Mark Network. Bing! Uh, what about email? Can they email us? Where's the email? Uh, they can email us, especially if they're Dr. Jenna Moran, um, about <laughs> hanging out with us, going to dinner with both of us. Have dinner with uh, me! <laughs> yeah. Uh, please come on the show and talk to us, specifically if you're Dr. Jenna Moran. I don't even expect, like, like what she would, she'd probably, like like just pass like images of tarot cards to someone like on her discord server and then they would message us like third party style like okay jenna heard your question and she answers with the seven of swords and we have to be like okay fuck what does that mean okay shit it's gonna <laughs> like, it's gonna come to us via vance yeah. <laughs> vance is going to like we're gonna be in the same space vance is gonna pull the seven of swords out of their mouth <laughs> <laughs> be like a message from the good doctor and there and there will, there will be a drawing of a butterfly on the other side of it we'll be like oh shit what does it mean we're trying to commune with jenna moran okay uh where's our twitter it, I, I didn't even say the email address oh, we just did email? a bit bonus exp cast at gmail.com i got sucked into the bit what about our twitters uh our twitters are at bonus exp cast and you could you could send us cryptic messages there mm -hmm. well. yes please do please do I would I would actually really enjoy that. Right. Yeah. If you want to hang out with us, if you want to uh, hang out with Discord us, Discord is in fact publicly we have open. A we just have special things for patrons if you join. Go to our Discord, tinyurl.com slash bxp discord. Yeah, it's just that easy. Yep. We have it linked in a bunch of places. The doors are always open. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can, we are we are doors are open. Come hang out. Come and go as you please. Where are you on Twitter? Tell them. I'm on Twitter at Ray W. Cole. That's it. That's all I had to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm I'm on Twitter. I'm at Zenith Sun. Uh, and I think that's it. Yep. I think that's all. All right. Well, everybody get out. All right. I, yeah. I gotta all right. Go. Change if you want to. Change, change if, if you, you want, want to. to. Farewell. Goodbye. Do I have to do this? Ugh, fine. Bonus Experience is written and produced by Monica and Ray. And edited by Margaret. Our logo and art is by Nino Studios. Find her on Facebook and Instagram. Our theme song is Reuse Noise with the Light by CDK. And is used under the attribution, non-commercial, creative commons license. BXP is part of the Misdirected Mart Network. Uh, I'm not reading this. Fuck it. Bye. Now listen to me, young man. I am talking directly into your ear now. I need you to do me a favor. You will do this for me. I need you to go to GameStop. I need you to ask the bastard working the counter if they have Bambi on the PS2. If you come back empty-handed, you'll be in big trouble, mister. You'll... <laughs> you will never see the light of day. <laughs> Hey, Margaret, can you cut all of that and then put it at the end after the credits? <laughs> just, please put, just just remove this from this section and then the put it after the credits uh, so that anyone who listens to the whole episode gets a terrible surprise. <laughs>